You know what they say, politics is just show business for ugly people. Well, that's not the case. So get your face on your official .vote campaign web address. Jokes are funny, politics are not. Get your .vote web address from 101domain.com or godaddy.com today. Welcome to another episode of Breaking Battlegrounds with your hosts Chuck Warren and Sam Stone. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, leading into what we hope will be a fantastic new year for everyone out there listening. Uh, on the line with us right now, a guest Chuck and I are both very excited to have on the program, hopefully spread a little bit of Christmas cheer alongside uh, your affable hosts here. Richard Paul Evans, number one New York Times, USA Today, and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, uh, best known for writing The Christmas Box, and most recently his book, The Noel Diary, is the number one movie on Netflix starring Justin Hartley. So, Richard, welcome to the program. Glad to be with you. Thank you. So, Rick, it's it's been quite a journey from the years you were doing campaigns for Norm Bangader and Senator Bob Bennett, hasn't it? Quite the journey. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I never thought I would end up here. You didn't? I mean, it wasn't written out on a yellow pad? I, you know, I thought I was going to be in politics, actually. Right. So, if you remember, I ran for the state, legislat uh, state legislature when I was running Bob Bennett's um, marketing campaign. I lost by 100 votes. Best thing that ever happened. That's when I wrote the Christmas box. <laughs> well, what's amazing about that, and that's a good lesson, so here's a book idea, just how sometimes we think we have a path and God takes us a different direction, right? And you probably have done more good for so many people versus if you have been in the state legislature and maybe beyond. Cer certainly has fewer gray hairs. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm completely gray, so that's not <laughs> But, but I, this is, I'm sure, a lot more fun. This is, um, you know, we started the Christmas Box House. We've helped more than 135,000 abused children. And um, it's, it's been an amazing ride. It still is. Well, I want, we want to talk about your, your book, The Noel Diary, that's on Netflix. It was number one the week it came out, and then we also want to talk about The Christmas Miracle. But as I was doing a little research for this interview, um, you told a story, which I hope you'll share here, about how you were up at a filming for one of your movies in Canada, and you had dinner with the producer after who had done hundreds and hundreds of movies. He was well-known, and you asked him the question, what did it cost you? Could you share that with our audience? Yeah, yeah, it was it was a really touching, and and um, I'm a little I'm a little uncomfortable sharing it because it's a private it's not a private right. conversation, but obviously it's out. Um, you know, I just he was telling me about the movies he's produced, and he's done some amazing amazing things in movies that you've seen, and and um, and it just struck me. I said, you know, you, you're that successful. What did it cost you? And he he got very serious, and he looked down and he said, um, everything. He said, "My wife's leaving me," and um, it was it was a really powerful moment. You know, it was a really powerful moment about choices and decisions. And um, you know, I felt you know I, it was just a very moving thing, and it was a good it was a good life lesson as well. So that story, I think, would be a good basis for many of your Christmas books. Um, they're about redemption. They're about introspection. They're about forgiveness. Why is this, de this theme so familiar and so paramount in the novels you write? Well, I, I mean, it, my book, The Christmas List, that was about seven years ago. That's completely the thing. Um, and, you know, the, the idea of staying with what it matters most, you, you know, because there, uh, when you're, you know, when you're looking for joy, I mean, I, I think right now in my life, it's like what brings me most joy. And Carrie and I are empty nesters now, and, and um, we're freely enjoying it. And she got a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and we get up in the morning, and our little Calipoo jumps in bed with us. And the other day, I just leaned over and said, you know, Carrie, I'm really happy. Um, I'm just really happy. I just, it's, we have a good life. We, our daughter, um, we have our first doctor in our family. We went to Texas. She went to TCU and graduated. And um, when they said, you know, Dr. Allison, it's like, it's, what a thrill. And, um, you know, we worked hard in those, as you know, we worked hard in those early days, but always staying focused on uh, our family and, and just doing our best as parents. And, of course, we screwed up. Um, but 
there was never a lack of love there and to see it pay off and uh, the fact that we have good relationships with all of our children and they like it that they like to come over that they we still get together i mean that is really the thing as you get older it's really you see as the greatest blessing well hopefully in a family conversation the comment will not come out that you and your wife are very happy that you're empty nesters and when the dog jumps up on the bed you're really happy oh, now oh they know that <laughs> we, we tell the them. cat's We're out of the bag that's the other thing. We're very honest. <laughs> and they think it's funny. My son calls the dog my second son. <laughs> um, let's talk about the Noel Diary and yep. how I went to Netflix. And first of all, Justin Hartley. It's just almost not fair someone's that good looking, is it? Oh, my gosh. I had no idea just how handsome this guy is. Uh, just Every time I say his name, women, they, like, they turn a different color and they <laughs> melt. I've never seen anything like it. I mean... <laughs> It, it's amazing, and when um, Carrie and I got to do something really fun, something I always dreamed of, we we went to the Hollywood walkthrough with the red carpet and all the celebrities and all the stars, and it was like it was so much fun. And um, but Justin wasn't supposed to be there because he was doing all the New York TV shows, right, promoting the movie. And right, he showed up. He showed up. He got got on a plane and flew out, which was really cool of him. And, and um, so Carrie, goes, Carrie was saying, yeah, it's too bad Justin isn't here. I wanted to meet him. I said, well, turn around. And he was right there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I go, and um, I go, Justin, um, I go, wow, you're really tall. He goes, yeah, he's taller than you think. And he goes, yeah, I, I hear that. I said, you're very handsome. <laughs> he said, and, and he said, well, so are you. And I said, no, you're claw your eyes out. Handsome. <laughs> I go, you're at this whole other level. And, and um he was he was really cool. <laughs> now, and see Jamie here in our studio is shaking her head because he hasn't been any in any Star Wars uh, features. <laughs> so so she doesn't not care. He'd be good in Star Wars. He'd be good in Star Wars. So well, he'd certainly be better. What was the what was the guy who played Anakin the paste, pasteboard oh, in those Skywalker those three? Oh, that was terrible. Yeah. So um, tell us about the Noel Diary. What what? How do you come up with these ideas? Well. Um, every, you know, they say every book is about the author, and, and that one is really true. In fact, director Charles Shire found out that showing it, he, he asked me that. And I said, well, it's, it's partially my life. He's like, what? He goes, are you serious? I go, yeah, it's based on my life. Um, when I was, when I was um, a baby, my mother was hospitalized with depression. My mother really struggled with mental illness. Um, and when um, I finally, in my 40s, I go, Dad, who watched over me? I said, wait, I'm a baby for that, for that two years. Who, someone had to have me. And his response was, well, I didn't have anything to do with you. I said, yeah, I know that, Dad. It's like, <laughs> so who, I mean, you didn't just like leave me there. To, and he goes, Pam. And I go, who's Pam? And she was an unwed mother. And um, my dad was a social worker. And back in those days, if a girl got uh, pregnant out of, you know, out of wedlock, they would just send her another city. They just denied she existed. They just wanted to hide her. Could have brought so much shame on the family, and so um, we would bring in these these unwed, you know, teen mothers. And so Pam took care of me. And I and the thing is, I would I had glimpses of this of this woman, you know. It's like there were times I, w- I would have these memories. It's like I don't know who that was, someone holding me. Um, it was deep in my memory. And and then um, the year before I wrote the book. The, the baby that was in her stomach showed up just like in the movie. She showed up at my father's house looking for her mom. Wow. And the, thing is, the thing is her mom had denied that she ever existed. She did find her mom and her mom said, no, I didn't have a baby. And my dad being a counselor, he said, look, back in those days, it was, she had so much pressure. Her husband may not know she was ever pregnant. And um, so she would deny you. And it was like, she was just heartbroken. Wow. Just heartbroken. So I mean, it was such it was such a basis of a story, but but it's a basis in reality. But this woman existed, and I've met her. I mean, it's um, it, so it's it yeah. I mean, the best the best things come from real life. I, I was going to say. I mean, I I think when you talk to most authors, that is such a central element of writing a really gripping novel, uh, or something that really imparts knowledge to people. It's just basing it on on at least on some level on your own experience, right? How much of, you've written a ton of books. Do all of them have some element of that personal experience in them? All of them, all of them do to some, you know, some level or something I'm ex- exploring. Like my walk series, my walk series was my exploration of why we live during one of the most difficult times of my life. My health, um, 
I mean, seriously, I went, I had a company that went bankrupt. I lost millions of dollars. It just about bankrupted me. Just, uh, I was having panic attacks. My health went down. I uh, came down with rheumatoid arthritis. I could barely walk. Um, came down with diabetes. I mean, the stress, it's like in one year, it's like my life was over. And um, I was trying to recover myself, which I have. And, uh, but boy, if you saw me back then, Chuck, I weighed 70 pounds more and I was walking with a cane. Oh, my goodness. Um, I was, it's like I was ready to die. It's just like, okay, it's gone. And um, I was down at my ranch, which is my one safe place. And I was walking and this, it, it, this idea came to me. It just this voice said, you need to write more. I had more than one book a year. It's like, you need to write more. And um, I decided to write a book about walking. I'm out there walking. It's like, what about, what if you took away everything that a, that a man valued? You took away his job, his name, um, and, you know, not, not that order. But you took away, first of all, you take away his wife. You take away his family. You take away his home. You take away his job, his reputation. You take it all away. Why do we live? And that's what the walk was. And it, it sold more than a million and a half copies. And to this day, it sells like crazy. I'm hoping we'll, we'll do a mini series on it. But um, it's one of the most powerful things. And it was my exploration of why am I still alive? And by the time I finished that, I mean, I found other people who um, one, one woman came up. She goes, you need to talk to my daughter. Her daughter had decided to commit suicide. She decided to wait for the end of the series. It was a five-book series. And, did, and at the end, she goes, I'm going to follow this man's path and decide if life is worth living. And she said, and I said, so did you? It was the last book. She goes, yeah, it's worth living. Um, wow. So, and I get stacks of mail every week from prisons uh, mm. because the men, the men in prison relate to the story of losing everything. And so, um, you know, when we connect to our to our deepest selves and to our cores, that's when we really connect with others. Boy, I, I hate to suggest a new assignment, but that seems like a book in itself is those letters. Um, you know, I kind of did that with one of my, um, with the Christmas box books, uh, with the Christmas box book, I wrote a book called the Christmas box miracle. Uh, there were so many miracles and people showing up. I mean, it was, it was, it was amazing. People were, um, hearing voices telling them to go in the store and buy the book. I heard that at least six times. They walk into a mall and a voice says, go in the bookstore and buy the Christmas box. And they went and bought it having no idea. The Christmas box is healing for people who have lost children, and in every case, they had just lost a child. I saw so many miracles like that that it was almost, it got to the point that you couldn't deny it. It, it would be absurd to deny it. And when I wrote the Christmas box miracle, um, we, Simon and Schuster actually hired a private eye. Or, well, actually, they had a law, law firm going to to make sure everything was, was true. And I hired a private eye to track everything down. And what we came up with is the miracles were actually bigger than we thought. Wow. Wow. Sure. Uh, we're with Richard Paul Evans, New York Times bestselling author. He is the author of The Noel Diary, which is the number one Christmas movie on Netflix. I've watched it. Kylie's watched it twice. He's also just come out The Christmas Miracle. This is Sam and Chuck with Breaking Battlegrounds. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Breaking Battlegrounds with your hosts, Chuck Warren and Sam Stone. Folks, are you concerned with stock market volatility, especially with Joe Biden in office? What if you could invest in a portfolio with a high fixed rate of return that's not correlated to this mess of a stock market? A portfolio where you'll know what each monthly statement will look like, but no surprises, where you can turn your monthly income on or off, compound it, whatever you choose, and there's no loss of principal if you need your money back at any time. Your interest is compounded daily, you're paid monthly, and there are no fees. This is a secure, collateralized portfolio that delivers a high fixed interest rate. Talk to our friends at Y Refi. They're local. You can meet with them. Uh, they are a due diligence approved firm. And with Y Refi, right now, you can earn up to 10.25% rate of return. 10.25%. Pretty darn good in this market, folks. Just log on to investyrefi.com. That's invest, the letter Y, then refy.com, or call them at 888 YREFI24. That's investyrefi.com, or call 888 YREFI24. And make sure you tell them to tell them that Chuck and Sam sent you so we can keep the lights on over here, folks. Absolutely. I'm with Richard Paul Evans, New York Times bestselling author. 
His most recent release is The Christmas Memory. I got the name incorrect in the previous segment. And also The Noel Diary, which is on Netflix now. Highly recommend you watch that with your family. It's a great, 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 great movie. Um, Rick, so you've written dozens of Christmas novels. What have you learned about Christmas now from your first book three decades ago? What's changed your perspective of the holiday? Not a thing. And I love that because that's what makes it beautiful. It's one of those unchanging things. Um, Christmas, when I was you know, um, young, and, and in my book, Christmas Memory, you'll see what my childhood was like. And we were very poor. And it was like the one magical time of the year. Right. And um, the fact that that can remain. Um, I, you know, I love, I love this season. And I, I just... So one time I can kind of let, let myself down a little bit. Um, the one big change is because ever since the New York Times coordinated me, the king of Christmas fiction, I, of course, I'm, you know, like I had 22 media interviews yesterday. It's just like <laughs> it, it, it's become insanely busy. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that it's you know, such a beautiful season. I, I, I got to ask then, how decorated is your house? Like, are it's you? Not, are, uh, it's, okay. it, it's, I have, we have beautiful lights outside and we, um, I pay a friend who's, uh, to do our tree. They're gorgeous, but Carrie suffers from really intense OCD and, and she can't do clutter. So we ha- we do this compromise. It's like, cause my first job is take care of her. Right. I mean, right. so yeah. it, as my, my house would be insanely decorated. In fact, I had a room in my office that was, um, the, my office building that was Christmas year round. I, I'm very much, very much Christmas. Um, but it, out of you know love for her, it's like our home is very simple. And then she and she pushes herself. It's like it's like she brought up two reindeer and put them on the table. <laughs> Glenna, you don't, and then she goes, How, "Oh, and she gives me nutcrackers. I have like the coolest nutcracker collection." And she was one saying, Can, "Let's bring them out." And it's like, "Okay, you're pushing yourself. I love it." <laughs> but 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 she's like, you know, you, you met Carrie Chuck. That's yes. why Chuck can call me Rick because we know each other. Um, Carrie is, you know, she's she's my girl. She's my person, and. Um, you know, that comes first. So like, decorations, they come and go. <laughs> he doesn't. Rick, you mentioned earlier that the beautiful thing is Christmas hasn't changed. You've always loved it. It's this magical season. Um, you are the founder of the Christmas Box International that helps foster kids, abuse kids. Is that something hard for you to see that many of those have not experienced the magic of Christmas among many other things they've not experienced it? Is that hard for you to witness and see? It's hard, and um, it's also beautiful that we're doing it. As I get older, this becomes my, more and more my priority. Uh, in fact, that's where I'll be today, down there working with kids. Um, something we added on, I don't know if you're doing this, um, when I, I, when you were around, Chuck, we, we, we took over from the county, uh, the Christmas program, because our the Christmas box house is so efficient. It runs so well. The people are we're such we're just such they're such good employees. They're so dedicated. They've all taken pay cuts, and um, because of that, we have the trust of the community. And so we were bringing in all the donations almost for the count for the county for Christmas for these abused um, children, and they finally said, "Why don't you guys take it over?" So we do Christmas for about twenty five hundred um, abused and neglected children and teens every year. And it is, it's amazing. But it, you asked if it's hard. I remember we, um, when we used to go down, um, we don't like to keep kids in the shelter. We usually get them with families, but sometimes you can't. And we went down there and there were two boys in the Christmas box house. And when we came in, we were going to decorate cookies. They didn't want it to have anything to do with it. And they went over, they turned the TV off and said, the Evans are here. You're going to go decorate cookies. And they turned it off and the kids pulled hoods over their heads. And I go, whoa, 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 I go, no, turn the TV back on. I said, they don't have to do anything. It's their Christmas. And then I walked over to them and I had these two cans of Frosty. And I go, hey, guys, um, you guys don't have to help, but I bought these for you. And they gave them the cans of Frosty. And they're like, these are ours. It's like, yeah, you can eat it. Don't eat it all at once. So it'll make you sick. But... <laughs> and they're like, really? And then one of them said, well, we could help. And they came over and they had such a good time with my daughters. And I remember walking out afterwards, and we spent about an hour just decorating cookies. They did like 20 cookies. It was great. And we walked out, and my daughter was crying. She was, Dad, how could someone be mean to those boys? Mm. And I said, it's, it's just, she goes, it's awful. I said, yeah, it is, honey, but aren't you glad that we have a place for them to protect them? And, and she just turned to me and goes, I love you, Dad. And it's like, 
those are the kind of moments you never, I get choked up. You you never forget. It's like, yeah, there's always going to be pain in this world. It's just the way it is. It's like, but if we can step out and try to make it better. And now I'm old enough that uh, these kids come to me um, as adults and will come to me and say, you have no idea the part you played in my life. And the hardest time of my life, because of what you did, I got through it. And um, it makes life so worthwhile. It makes, it's just like, you know, and I could die now and, and feel like I, I made a difference in this world and I blessed some lives. And that's what it's about. How do people donate or volunteer at the Christmas Box International, Rick? Oh, they can, they, you can go down there. You can donate like on a one-time basis or then we, and otherwise we have to do background checks. We protect those children at all costs. Good. Um, but go to Christmas, just go to um, the Christmasbox.org thechristmasbox.org, and uh, there's ways to give. But um, check more than 84% go directly to the kids, and then we magnify that. The program is so good. It's just so good. It's so smart. It's one thing to have, have heart, but this is has brains, too. It's a program that we can magnify any donation and do more good. It's the only way we can we can. And, you know, and, help help that many right. kids. Right, and you use your resources wisely. Charity Navigator has given you guys a great rating. It says you can donate with confidence, and a lot of charities aren't that way. I, mean, I think the law requires 10% to be given away, and you're doing 84%, so fantastic. Yeah, it's, I, I love I love Christmas Box. The only thing that was down on, on our charity was it says, like, they might be unstable because they have big loans. The big loans are to me. I load millions of dollars to keep it going. And I haven't required, they don't pay interest. I haven't required to pay back because, um, you know, this is what we want to happen someday. I would like if, if it becomes bigger that they, you know, pay back my kids someday. Right, right. But uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I love the Christmas box. In it's, that's an amazing, it's an amazing <laughs> thing you're doing. I know my folks uh, do something on a much more limited basis with the local shelter in their little town um, where there's, you know, there's a foster care shelter there. Um and folks, definitely get out there, log log on to. I think Richard, you said the Christmas Box International dot org, well, or just actually just do this. That's the Christmas Box dot org. Just go to richardpaulevans dot com because I have all the things we do. I have I have the charity. There's everything, so that's easier to remember. richardpaulevans.com. dot com. You can even get free cookie recipes. <laughs> you, you can't beat that, no, folks. No, no. Free cookies and. Good things for the holidays. More with Richard Paul Evans when Breaking Battlegrounds comes back. Welcome back to Breaking Battlegrounds with your host, Chuck Warren. I'm Sam Stone. On the line with us right now, Richard Paul Evans, number one global bestseller, bestselling author of The Christmas Box. He is also the founder of Christmas Box International. Folks, as we were heading to break, as Richard told you, go to richardpaulevans.com. You can find all of his books, all of his works, but also you can support this incredible organization doing this great work for the holidays. And there is still time to make sure that a a bright uh, Christmas morning uh, happens for at least a few more kids in this country. And that's about as worthy a thing as you can possibly do today. Rick, I have two questions. One's, one's technical. So you write, you, you put out a Christmas book every year. Have you started next year's Christmas book already? I haven't. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit behind. I also have a young adult series, Michael Bay, which is a number one New York Times series with Global. And um, I have to write that first. See, <laughs> so, see Rick, Richard writes like started. my mother shops. So, yeah. So no, Rick, geez. Rick, are you, the ty- are you the type of author that wakes up in the morning, gets moving and blocks out three hours? Or is it like I have a a flash of brilliance and I'm going to go hold myself up in a hotel room. You just completely described me the latter. Um, like Mary Higgins Clark. And I knew Mary um, loved Mary, but she would have this routine. She would get up at six every morning, get up to have some tea, right. Until like, like till 10 have breakfast. And, you know, it's like me. It's like, Oh, I guess I better write of a deadline. And lock myself <laughs> away and write. Sort of like how we do the show. Um, Rick, well, my book, my, my book out right now, A Christmas Memory, uh-huh. last year at the time, Chuck, I had pneumonia. And um, after three weeks of getting worse, I caught COVID. And oh it, it's like, and I, had a, yeah, and I had a friend who had the same thing passed away. He's my age. And it's like, I may not make it. This is, mm. I was so sick. I've never been that sick in my life. And then the book, A Christmas Memory, started coming to me. And I got a notepad and I wrote it laying in bed. And um, when I, I thought it's probably COVID fog, it's probably stupid. Two months later, when I started to recover, I read it and I thought this is the best thing I've ever written. And so 
so that's how that one came last year. So I, I might have to get sick again because it's my favorite. It's my it's my favorite book in twenty years. Just go to the ranch and walk. We're gonna we're gonna recommend against <laughs> yeah. getting sick ne- again. Next thing you know, we're gonna have authors all over the globe getting COVID. <laughs> do you write? Do you? Are you said you took a notepad? So do you write by longhand on a notepad or do you do computer? Both, both. Um, I have. This is really weird. I have Tourette syndrome, as you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things when they diagnosed me, they said you have to. Do you like to touch sharp things? Do sharp things bring you comfort? And I took seven sharp things out of my pocket. So I, I, I have lined up like a couple dozen really sharp pencils. I have four pencil sharpeners in my den. Um, I like collect pencil sharpeners. It's like, so I have to write with really sharp. I edit, but you have to put things on computer these days to be able to move them around and edit and things. So um, I actually write it and then have someone type it into the computer. That, that I... You know, it's interesting with every author, and I've talked to a few of them, everyone has their own process for it. Um, But there's a surprising number of authors who at least start their first draft with a paper and pencil instead of a computer. I think there's something about it. There's something about the feel of it. Do you feel connected to it? I, I, I can't even describe it. I love pencils. I actually, I literally collect pencils. My kids give me pencils for Christmas. I know that sounds weird. Do do you have a favorite pencil? (laughs) Is there like some special pencil that's your favorite pencil? Yeah, there is, and and um, oh my gosh, it's something such the same pencil that John Steinbeck used, and and I love their slogan. It says, "If you have to ask why you pay five dollars for a pencil, you won't get it." <laughs> <laughs> now, so so this is the company that that makes the pencils that Steinbeck used. Yes, they they've been making pencils for a hundred years. It's the most amazing pencil ever. The racer doesn't look anything like they're used to. They're amazing. <laughs> okay, now I, I'm I'm gonna have to. We're gonna have to back channel this. Exactly. I need I need to know where this pencil. We will. Where we I will get find this pencil. out. Yeah, Rick, we have two minutes left. Um, share with our audience what Christmas means to you, and give them a challenge this Christmas. Is it being introspective? Is it going out and reconnecting with family and friends who've been lost in the past? What what, what, what does it mean to you, and what's the challenge for our audience? Christmas is is, is a time of introspection. I'm I'm a Christian, and to me, even though you know it wasn't really Christ's birth at that time of the year, it doesn't matter. It's a time that we that, as Dickens said, we see each other as as uh, fellow passengers to the grave, and I think that's what it is to me. That we step aside, we step back from our businesses, from our causes, we step back, and just extend grace. Uh, one thing I found on the road this year is like people are really angry. I actually had a woman yeah. shove me at the airport. I mean, they're really angry and unhappy. And it really is a time that we need to step up, that we need to just look to act in sincere kindness and and to look at each other as like, hey, we're not here forever. It's, right. Let's take care of each other. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Richard Paul Evans, folks. You can follow all his work and support uh, the charity, the Christmas Box International, by going to richardpaulevans.com. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate having you on the program, and uh, I think hopefully look forward to having you back in the future here, possibly sometime around next Christmas. We would love to, and it's been a lot of fun. Good, good uh, connecting with you again. Thank you. Fantastic, folks. Breaking Battlegrounds will be back in just a moment. Running for office? You need a campaign website. Introducing the web address of the democratic process, .vote. So how do you purchase your .vote website? Visit www.yourname.vote. Type your website name, example www.johnsmith.vote. It's available. Add your web address to your cart and check out. Once checked out and have received confirmation, you may begin to create and utilize your website to connect and engage voters. To learn more, visit get.vote. Happy campaigning! 